Hi, I'm Deb Newberry, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time with you talking about nanotechnology and the relationship that it has to agriculture, especially some of the new developments. So to get started, I'm going to open my PowerPoint uh, set and do what we are all so used to seeing done. I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> I'm going to click on the file that I want, of course. And then I'm going to start with the slideshow. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about, as I said, the uniqueness and positive combination that is a result of the integration between nanotechnology and agriculture. <laughs> but before I do that, I'd like to talk about a little bit the history of nanotechnology, how it has impacted the first two major industries, both the semiconductor fabrication industry and the medical industry. And then we'll talk about how it's influencing agriculture and the evolution of agriculture in a little bit of detail. And on this slide, I have also given you three different email addresses, and I encourage you to contact me at any time with perhaps questions or suggestions for additional um, topics that we can cover or research that you may be aware of that might impact the relationship between agriculture and nanotechnology. So let's get started. Something that we all know how the modern uh, era of nanotechnology got started was in 1959 when Richard Feynman gave a talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And so I think that as that uh, thought and process entered the minds of physicists, we started thinking about ways that we could manipulate and work at the atomic level. And it started out with an instrument like this. And you can see from the description that it was in 1981 that we had a piece of equipment like this that first allowed us to start doing amazing things with individual atoms. And this is the iconic image of the xenon atoms creating the IBM logo, where each one of those small little blue Hershey Kiss shapes is a xenon atom. And we created, we, the scientists at the research lab at IBM, created the IBM logo. And of course, the Nobel Prize went along with it a few years later. So that was kind of like, wow, this is amazing. And then the next thing was we kept thinking, well, that was a fairly large piece of equipment. Can we make it smaller, better, easier to use? And of course, we did it. In, for, in fact, this is one of the earliest scanning ten, tunneling microscopes created by IBM. And not quite a tabletop SEM yet or an AFM yet, but getting closer, we were working toward that goal. And of course, one of the very first industries that was interested in manipulating individual atoms was the semiconductor industry. And so it turned out that companies like IBM and Intel and other companies such as Global Foundries, perhaps a little bit later, but they were very interested in being able to shrink the size of transistors, therefore being able to put more functionality, more, more transistors in a given area. And so those folks at uh, the semiconductor fabrication facilities and within that industry started looking for uh, engineers, technicians that had the skills that they needed. And as a result, we can now create very large silicon wafers, you know, 300 uh, millimeters in diameter with millions, if not more, transistors in every individual chip on that device. And so that's when we started looking at semiconductor fabrication, electrical engineering. What aspects of nanotechnology do people that work in those facilities, both engineers, PhDs, uh, master's degrees, and also technicians need to have as skills. And so in terms of skills, knowledge, and abilities, they were things like 
they had to know the language of nanotechnology. They had to be able to speak in nanometers and understand the, the size scale pretty well. They had to understand a certain aspect of the chemical aspects associated with nanotechnology and the fabrication process. They also had to know about clean room protocol because that was exactly where the semiconductor devices were created in a very, very clean environment. They had to have a fabrication process understanding and that included dealing with hazardous chemicals. They had to know how to work the um, equipment and do complete and very thorough documentation. There were also aspects of quality assurance and uh, quality control that fed into the requirements for some of these employees. I might just move my image a little bit if it's still here. I'll move it down to the right-hand corner. Should have done that earlier, I apologize. But this is a chart from Roco, Mike Roco. Um, in, in 2013. So we, we had certainly evolved from the semiconductor fabrication as the sole stovepipe for nanotechnology application. And we're moving into uh, trying to understand how nanotechnology or understanding the world at the atomic and molecular level could influence different technologies or be influenced by those technologies. And so we were looking at some of the cognitive sciences, the information technology, and how nanotechnology fed into all of those. And this is one of the charts that Rocco uses quite, a, quite often to explain just the convergence and the interdisciplinarity disciplinary aspects of nanotechnology with multiple um, different technologies. The one I want to focus on is on the right hand side, the biotechnology aspect, because after we started applying nanotechnology skills in semiconductor fabrication, creating transistors, unbelievably small, uh, very powerful uh, processing units as a result, we started looking at how can nanotechnology be applied to the molecules that were created from. And so nanotechnology moved into the realm of medicine, but more, um, more distinctly or more, uh, more closely into the areas of detection and diagnosis. Now, even though this particular chart that I chose has um, certain aspects of the nanotechnology being injected into a human body. In reality, a lot of the early biotechnology or medical related applications of nanotechnology was truly in detection and diagnosis, things that happen outside of the body. So because of nanotechnology and the applications of some of the concepts of nanotechnology, we're now able to detect the, the uh, protein targets that are representative of certain types of cancers at a much lower concentration. You know, it used to be they'd take a test tube of blood, send it off to a lab, and the results would come back maybe a week later. And in those cases, you had to have a moderately high level of the target protein that was um, expressed from the cancer tumors that you might have in your body for it to be detected. Because of nanotechnology, those diagnosis tests, those detection tests have become uh, much more proficient at detecting proteins at a very much lower concentration. And so what happens is the diagnosis comes earlier, treatment is easier, the prognosis is better, <laughs> costs go down, a whole lot of benefits of being able to detect and treat, treat diseases at a very early stage. And that is happening because of uh, developments and advancements in nanotechnology. So that's one of, one of the aspects and the applications of nanotechnology. Another one, I don't have a chart for it, but um, when we were looking at nanotechnology and especially carbon nanotubes, small, hollow, biocompatible tubes, if you will, and a lot of the folks in the medical community were looking at carbon nanotubes as possible replacements for veins or arteries 
or perhaps they could be used to create replacement portions of kidneys or livers. And part of the um, part of the problem was this is a whole physics aspect of it. But part of the problem was water or fluids don't quite behave the same way at the nanoscale as they do at the macro or micro scale. And that was one of the challenges that we found in terms of trying to use carbon biologically compatible for certain medical applications. And what happened in a lot of that research was in parallel with the laboratory experiments and research, uh, computer models were also being created of fluids interacting with nanoscale entities um, in different ways. And so it was, it, it um, created a whole new environment for assessing, using computer simulations to assess what might be happening in the physical world, and especially what might be happening at the nanoscale. It was, it was another um, aspect of the ever increasing reach of understanding nanoscale phenomena at, by the use of computer simulations in the medical field. Another aspect is just looking at different types of true applications, implementation of nanotechnology materials into the body and how they interact with different cells within the body, different proteins, different uh, fluids, the different, all the myriad of structures that we have in the body. And so um, I thought this was a very good representation of what we're looking at trying to activate cells um, outside of the body. And then like the text says, injecting them back into the body. And if you're interested in more of this um, type of research and at a high level, as well as at a very detailed research level, the National Can Cancer Institute website is a very, <laughs> wealth of information, a lot of detail, and it's a very good place to find information of this type. And then also we're looking at uh, nanomaterials in terms of how it uh, impacts the uh, immune system. And this is, as the text says, it's a complex pathway and of unique uh, interest to me anyway, is the multiple ways that nanotechnology are used in this diagram that I have at the right hand side. If you look at it, nanoparticles, NPs, as represented here, are used to increase certain um, T cell activities, our, our um, warrior cells that go after invaders in our body, those T cells. And then also nanoparticles are used to improve the antigen um, presentation and then nanoparticles are used to increase um, cell depth. You know, can we use nanoparticles to help unhealthy cells <laughs> meet their end perhaps a bit sooner than they would uh, normally? And then finally, using nanoparticles to, to modify um, different aspects of the whole Im immune system. So there's, you can imagine <laughs> the amount of research that is not only currently ongoing, but also possible in terms of looking at how nanotechnology, man-made nanoparticles can influence different aspects of this process. And of course, you're all very much aware of how nanotechnology and the understanding of molecular interactions at the nanoscale has influenced the development of um, the different uh, applications of uh, shots and, and um, vaccines type things that we're using to treat the COVID pandemic and, and the resulting aspects of that. And it's, it, it's interesting because the pandemic was just a devastating, horrible thing to happen, but it's also shown the benefit and the application of nanotechnology to the world, that's one good thing. But another thing is as the different researchers were not necessarily working independently, but coming together and working together, we are understanding aspects of how our body works in ways that we, it would have taken us much longer to understand it. But the coming of the pandemic was just the impetus, the 
the energy, the, the reason to, the justification and reason to learn, uh, to get our, our uh, to get our act together and really work together and try and figure out how some of the systems in our body work. And so th there was, there were some research advantages to the pandemic as, as horrible as it was and the far reaching effects. And I, you know, won't get, <laughs> don't need to go into all of that. But I did want to say that from a medical standpoint, developing the vaccine and all of that research really helped bringing nanotechnology to uh, the awareness of a lot of people in, in public and in government and regulatory agencies, but also it helped us understand the whole mechanism of how our body works in ways that we, we weren't aware of um, a year or two ago. So enough said. Finally, what are the skills if you want to look at nanotechnology and biotechnology? Clearly understanding aspects of both of those dis disciplines, but also understanding aspects of how do we run experiments? How are they performed? Finally, and at the bottom, what are the regulatory processes that are required when you're working with living systems versus uh, a, a painting or a coat you know, a coating of paint on a wall, something that is innate versus a living system, regulatory aspects come in. And that has to be understood not only by the, the marketeers, but also by the engineers and technicians and researchers that are doing the work. Also, how do all of the tools of nanotechnology, because in developing our solutions to deal with, with the COVID, um, with that virus, we had to use atomic force microscopes, scanning electron microscopes, TEMs, different tools of nanotechnology in order to understand the structure of the protein, the spikes, or excuse me, the structure of the virus, the different proteins, the spikes, as well as how, how our body worked. And so knowing how to use atomic force microscopes and SEMs also played a critical role in, um, in solving coming close to solving some of the issues associated with the pandemic. So if you look at those skills, it's another set of skills. Now, just as nanotechnology has been evolving through the semiconductor fabrication and medicine, the biotechnology arena, agriculture has been evolving for a whole lot longer, thousands of years. You know, we have images from uh, the ancient Egyptians using plows and, and cattle to to till the soil. And then of course we use a lot of people to do um, harvesting and planting and all everything that was involved. And then finally, of course, we started using animals. And so through that whole thing, farming, agriculture was evolving. And then we finally created the, the mechanical aspects, the tractor, which has certainly evolved over time. And then now we have amazing uh, tools that are um, used in the agriculture industry. Some of the skills and, and knowledge and abilities that, that you would think of with agriculture, <laughs> hardworking long days of my father. My grandfather was a farmer. My father farmed for um, after he retired from his Air Force career. Uh, a mechanical acuity, being able to fix things and um, which was pretty amazing to be able to go into all the different types of machinery and be able to, to fix them, to weld pieces back together, to, to luge pieces together to make things work. A lot of problem solving. And of course, the crop and plant management, being able to look and, at um, your crops and figure out what to do, what would be the best solution. And now, of course, it's a lot of the farms are not the family farms anymore. They're very large farms and we have mass produced food and um, crops and food production. Now, <laughs> I, as I was preparing for this presentation and looking for some of the images that you've seen already, I found this image. And it was a little bit frustrating for me because I found this image and as many places as I looked, I could not find any photo credits or any explanation of what it was a picture of. And so my question for you, my audience is, 
what is this thing and what is it doing? And <laughs> it was, um, I, I looked for quite a while and I even gave, sent this picture to a couple of my friends that are very savvy in terms of Googling and searching things out on the internet and you know data mining and that type of thing. And I said, here's a picture, but I don't know what it is. Can you help me? Well, turns out that my dear brother, who is a part-time farmer, you know, he's got a couple hundred acres and he does farm. My brother knew what it was. And so I now actually know what it is. And let me just move my image again. <laughs> But if, if you have a guess or an idea, I would welcome your input. <laughs> and if you send me a guess to dmnewberry2001 at yahoo.com, I would be more than happy to tell you exactly what this machine is and what it's doing. <laughs> anyway, I had to put it in here kind of like a giant spider following a, <laughs> a, a tractor. So, the application of natural or, you know, manufactured nanotechnology, te nanomaterials, nanoparticles is having a substantial impact on the production of food crops. We're, um, we're in a little bit of a bind because the population of the world is increasing at a faster rate than we are able to increase the amount of food that we can produce. And that's kind of a problem. Um, there are, there are a lot of people that are hungry in the world right now as it is. And if we don't find a solution to some of the food, the, the crop production problems, um, that, that issue is gonna get bigger. The effect of crop treatments, what, how do they impact the environment? That's something that's very critical and has to be studied in concert with, we need to look at the benefits as well as the risks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. The preparation and packaging of food, that's not a topic that I'm covering here, but there are a lot of papers out talking about how the food industry is impacted. And my next chart will kind of cover this at a summary level. And then is there a way that we can improve the nutritional value of food by the way that we grow it? If, um, you know, the idea, if the food is more nutritious, you don't need to eat quite as much of it. And again, that's the volume versus the world population. The, the point is that um, to do this in the right way, it requires the input and the awareness of people from multiple disciplines. You know, a long time ago, we, or at least within the last couple of decades, all of the traditional sciences, the traditional engineering disciplines have moved out of that stovepipe. And I think, professors and students and career counselors industry is realizing the impact of the multidisciplinary requirements for almost any industry um, and, and what it requires of employee and kind of going back to the, the focus of the Minty SIG, the E stands for education, you know, micro nanotechnology education special interest group. And so there's the education aspect and what has to be changed in the education environment. That's, that's another question uh, for perhaps a different discussion, but it does require the awareness of multiple disciplines. This chart, I'm not going to um, discuss in a great deal, but I liked it because it shows the many different ways that nanotechnology can impact not only the food production, the agricultural aspect of it, but also the food packaging. Uh, wouldn't it, it would be just amazing if there were a way that we could look at a package of food and there was a sensor perhaps based on nanotechnology on that food that could tell whether it had whether it had a bacteria infestation or whether it had salmonella or whether, whether somewhere along the line from growing the crop in the field to packaging it and setting it on a grocery store shelf, something had happened and we could tell before we even bought it or probably the store manager could tell before they put it out on the shelves that it wasn't, it did it didn't meet the safety and the health requirements before people start getting sick. So there's 
lots of applications of nanotechnology. One um, research article, a little bit of a digression here, but one research article I was reading recently talked about the fact that E. coli, a lot of times the, the introduction of E. coli into leafy green vegetables happens when that bacteria, that E. coli, is actually present in the water that's used to irrigate, to spray onto the plants as they're growing in, in the field. So that bacteria infestation happens as a result of the infestation that might be occurring in a very small amount, really small amounts in the water, but it's enough that when that irrigation water gets onto the plants, the plants get harvested, they have aspects of that um, con contagion, you know, um, on it, they get packaged, it goes into the stores and it's not, it's not a good result. But it was interesting to me that that the origin of some of the the um, bacteria or the infestations of whatever that occurs in some of our leafy green vegetables or our produce, especially, actually starts with the water that we use to irrigate to grow the plants. So that was huh, that was an interesting under, new understanding for me or awareness. And anyway, by this time, as I've been talking, I'm sure that you've read the, the different texts on uh, the different boxes. But the idea here is that nanotechnology has, has applications and the potential to impact um, agriculture and food science at many, many different levels. So if we start looking at nanomaterials and nanoparticles to improve the food production, you know, they can improve, I'm not gonna read these words to you, but plant growth. They can help create plants that can withstand drought or flooding, that can withstand high temperatures or low temperatures, you know, as, <laughs> as unfortunately the climate tends to change and temperatures can, can go up and down in um, an, an unprecedented, way that um, plants, we can create plants that can deal with some of those changes. And then another thing that's happening is the bottom bullet microstructure sensors that can detect when there's a fungus or an insect infestation very early on, perhaps in just a very small part of the field, you can immediately see that, that a nanomaterial, a nano the sensor material that's been deposited on the leaves of the plant starts to change color. And that's a representation of say an insect or a fungus infection. And because of that, that area can be treated rather than the whole field getting infected and having to treat the whole field, which is expensive, time consuming, and a, a lot of chemicals, you can just treat the one area that's been impacted. So lots of different ways that nanotechnology can improve food production. And my next slides in pictures, a picture can say a thousand words. <laughs> here, here are several images from this American Chemical Society paper. And this particular paper just is a good representation of uh, using nanoenzymes and non-nano, perhaps nanoparticle applications to work with aspects of helping to grow stronger plants that can deal with the environment, stronger plants. And here I chose just a portion of that one image to focus on, but look at the different um, aspects of improvement of different types of nanoparticles, you know, ability to, to increase the antioxidant enzyme content with our good old friends, titanium dioxide nanoparticles used in a lot of different places. Silicon dioxide nanoparticles, increased sugar and amino acid, perhaps increasing the nutrition value of the plant or of the, of the product that's a result of the plant. Down at the, um, in the root part of this image, we've got iron nanoparticles that, that can start, um, relieving the cadmium induced oxidative, oxidative stress. So we can create um, nanoparticle solutions to um, plants trying to deal with some of the heavy metals, arsenic and, and cadmium. So multiple ways that these nanoparticles are used, not only up at the, 
the part of the plant that's above the ground, but also the part of the plant that's below the ground. And again, here, um, just looking at, at um, how nanoparticles can Im impact plant growth. And again, looking at how can we prevent plants um, from dying due to the stress that happens in the environment. I mean, temperatures go up and down, the rain falls and the rain doesn't. And, and so the ability to create a crop, plants that can survive a wider range of environmental factors is also extremely important. And again, I chose just a portion of this chart to focus on, again, uh, nanoparticles, magnesium-based, silicon-based uh, nanoparticles that will inhibit bacterial growth or in, inhibit some of the, um, the wilt, the fusarium wilt that <laughs> can wipe out entire fields of different, different types of crops. And so using nanoparticles conscientiously can help make the crops that we plant productive and survive any types of stress, live longer, produce more, um, more crops, feed the world. So lots of aspects of nanotechnology. And again, finally, here's another chart from that one paper from the American Chemical Society. Um, it, you, the title is down at the bottom, Nanobiotechnology on Agriculture. And um, you can, you can see here nano fertilizers that are used for everything from the improvement of um, using iron and, and silicon nanoparticle based nanoparticles to increase seed germination so that every seed that you plant actually results in a, in a growing plant because a lot of times that doesn't happen. And it depends on the the soil, the moisture, as well as the character, the quality of the seed that's planted. So again, in this chart, you can see there's impacts down at the root, impacts at the leaf, um, impacts how a leaf is, uh, plant is going to respond to the sun and to the light. If we can create plants that will still grow healthily, even with a reduced amount of sunlight, perhaps in a, a rainier climate or a cloudier climate, then that would be a, a very positive thing to consider. So increased sugar and protein content in, in the peanuts, again, perhaps making them um, more nutritional as a food source. So just a myriad of ways that, that we can look at nanotechnology. And this is um, a chart from Greg Lowry and his group um, at Carne Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it was in Nature Nanotechnology, but I like this chart because it really talks about, we can't just look at the benefits. You know, as researchers, um, as members of a society, we can't just look at the benefits that nanotechnology, people who love nanotechnology like I do, we can't just close our eyes to some of the unintended or unexpected consequences, or even the things that we know might propose, or propose a risk, might result in a risk, we need to pay attention to them and be honest about them and report them and study them and be able to accurately and honestly weigh the benefits and the risks. One of the things that uh, Greg's group is doing that, that I think is interesting. Um, one of the problems with a lot of the fertilizers is plants need the nitrogen and a lot of fertilizers include a lot of nitrogen. However, not all of the nitrogen is absorbed either through the plant leaves or into the soil, into the root system. So there's a lot of um, nitrates, nitrogen uh, aspects, nitrogen-based chemicals that will end up running off or become in the soil, but more importantly, run off the field into the water supplies. That's not a good thing. And so his group, the group there is looking at using carbon-based, uh, you know, carbon nanotubes, carbon-based materials to replace some of the nitrogen, still having the same impact, but replace um, 
to reduce the amount of nitrogen that is run off from a field into the water system. So we're looking at nanotechnology. It still produces the same result from a plant level in terms of crop production, yield, and that type of thing as the fertilized, traditionally fertilized material, but without the impact to the environment. So again, we're always looking for ways to reduce emissions. Um, the synthesis, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, reduce the toxicity of the fertilizers and you know, the insecticides that we spray on the crops are, uh, can be non-trivial from a chemical standpoint. And so is there a way that we can reduce the toxic toxicity? Of course, we want to increase the yield. We want to um, reduce emissions. We want to increase the resiliency, food security. And so it's going to be always a balancing act between the benefits and the dollar revenue, the dollar benefit of those benefits, <coughs> dollar and population, how many people, the societal benefits, it's not always money, but the societal benefits, the environmental benefits of doing um, nanotechnology, of applying nanotechnology versus some of the un unintended consequences or the things that we already know that that might be toxic titanium dioxide nanoparticles. You know, they, they aren't good when you get a whole bunch of them in the ocean. They aren't good to the uh, mollusks and the critters that live, live in the sea. So putting them in sunscreen might not be the best thing. Again, that was an unintended consequence, consequence, but it was something that we learned. And so as we continue to investigate and research the sustainability, the environmental impacts of nanoparticles, we continue to learn things, nano uh, engineered materials. We continue to learn things and applying those to the new research. That connection, um, I think as, as researchers, as educators, as industry folk, we have an obligation to make sure that we don't allow our our own blinders to help to cause us to ignore things that we should be paying attention to. And, and not intended as a lecture, but again, we need to be able to weigh both sides of it. And the fact that we have to weigh both sides of it leads to a wealth of careers for our students. You know, folks that, students that are interested in the environment, students that are interested in working for a government regulatory agency like the EPA or the patent attorneys, you know, lawyers, regulatory, legal folks, environmental people, social impact people, ethical folks. Maybe some of our students want to study ethics. This is an excellent area beyond the technical and the engineering for students to, to have something to get their teeth into. They still have to understand aspects of nanotechnology and aspects of science, but they don't have to be experts in it. They can um, certainly impact um, the world around us without being a PhD nanotechnologist. So if you look at the skills, knowledge, and abilities required for nanotechnology and agri agriculture, of course, it's the biology, the botany focus. We're dealing with plants got to understand a certain aspect of that. The material science aspects. How do, <laughs> for example, if you create a new fertilizer, this has been an issue with some of the chemical fertilizers that you create a fertilizer that ends up being toxic or detrimental to the tanks that the farmer puts it in to spray it on, its feet, on the fields, whether it's plastic or metal or the paint. Um, <laughs> Some of those chemicals, those fungicides, those insecticides that we spray on the fields can be detrimental to the containers that hold them. So there's an aspect of material science that needs to be pulled into this. Manufacturing, as it, I use the term very loosely, the fabrication of nanoparticles. That's a skill that these folks need to know. How do you make a nanoparticle of a specific size, of a specific quality, of a specific um, purity? what is required, and then how, what is the manufacturing process to create those entities in volume? 
not just a handful in a lab, but they're going to need to be created in volume for <laughs> if we're going to feed a world of uh, 9 billion people or so by 2050, we need to be able to make a lot of these. The whole chemistry aspect, nanotechnology understanding, and, and again, as I alluded to earlier, the regulatory aspects. There's also a big uh, importance in terms of ecology, the whole ecosystem, environmental aspects, uh, being able to look at the big picture is going to be very important for students, for educators, for employees, and for, for companies to be able to look at the big picture because that's where not only the benefits are going to be able to be realized, but also the things that we need to be aware of. And finally, um, application engineering, how, and this application engineering, <laughs> poor phrase, I think, but I was thinking, how are we going to apply the nanoparticles? Are they going to be immersed in a liquid? Are we going to have them as an aerosol? Are they going to be a powder? Are we going to integrate them with this? Are we gonna integrate them with the seed like as a coating, um, which has done, been done, is done currently, or are we going to, is it better to put them into the soil in a tilling or a cultivating type process. So what is, what's the application? How are we gonna get these nanoparticles to interact with the world around us? So status opportunities and challenges. <laughs> you know, there are multiple nanomaterials that are already being researched, evaluated, applied. Um, you can read that, <laughs> you know, just, they're good, lots of opportunity. The assessment and evaluation is indeed a complex process that involves many factors, multiple disciplines. And so nanotechnology, I started doing nanotechnology in the late 80s and uh, it was a pretty stovepipe discipline at that point in time. And as I uh, showed you at the beginning of this, this presentation started out with the semiconductor fabrication and, and fully moved into material science, which I kind of ignored, but, but also the, uh, the biotechnology, the medical aspects. But now it's gonna impact farming and agriculture. The risks and the unintended consequences need to be considered. And the image of a farmer has changed and it needs to be acknowledged. It's no longer the guy with the corn cob pipe and the bib overhauls. It's uh, guys in suits and ties and, and women in suits and, and dresses or suits and um, running the corporate world, making these decisions. It's also a lot of research, researchers in, uh, in the white coats in the labs. It's a whole lot more. So there are just an amazing amount of opportunities and um, the students have the potential to play a major role in, in this arena. And perhaps companies that have never even really thought a whole lot about nanotechnology, what it is, and if their employees need to be aware of nanotechnology, I think they're becoming more aware and that is slowly changing. <laughs> we can help bring about that change. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention and listening to this. <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm laughing at myself because um, I'm a researcher and a scientist and an engineer, and I was also a corporate executive. Um, I wore dresses and skirts, but almost all the time I wear pants suits and pants now. So I'm still laughing at myself for the dresses comment that I made a little bit earlier. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I'm Deb Newberry, uh, CEO of Newberry Technology Associates. I have a lot of friends with ex ex expertise in various areas. We'd love to help you. There's the email. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Bye.